Fine, thank you, Matthias, for this nice introduction. In Europe, we have dragons too, <laughs> at least only in the uh, historical sources. And this is today uh, my subject. I will give you an overview over the um, yeah, historical sources belonging to the natural events in Europe. First, you have a lot of method methodological questions. I will give a quick overview about, about my periodization, the sources. Uh, we have to look at interpretation pattern in Europe. We take the, uh, the example of locusts in 873 for this. Then we have a big table with omens of birth and deaths of important rulers. And in the end, the solar eclipses, which were visible in China and Europe. And this is really special uh, because nobody has done a look on this before. And we will finish with a short view on the dragons. First, my sources, which I have used during my studies in the last 10 years for the second book, uh, were mostly annals and chronicles, capitularies, these are legacies, and some letters. And I didn't use so much charters because there are not so many natural events in there. I didn't use hagiographic sources because they are widely, widely instrumented and uh, it's a big methodological problem. And I didn't use knife flood data and stuff like this because even there, uh, it's, it's a lot too much. I already had too much material. So this is only my yeah, structure. So what I have done, I created this measuring grip every red dot on this map represents an archive of a monastery in the early and high medieval times. And you can see there are a lot of monasteries here in Central Europe, some in Ireland, and there's not so much material survived in Italy, which to me was surprising. You can see I also tried to have a look in the Near East up to Egypt in the sources which were already translated I'm not a Byzantinist, I cannot read Egyptian, so I was limited to the translations. Let's take a look in one of these annals. It's the Annales at Montensis, which were written in what is today the city of Salzburg in Austria. And here you can see the usual structure of these annals. You have the given year, and then you have a very, very short um, entrance like this one, an earthquake has happened. So, and that's it. Uh, more you will not find in this uh, whole annal about this year. And you can see there are some natural events like this. So the problem with all these annals and chronicles is that if a monk came from, let's say, Mainz to Salzburg, he brought his chronicle from one place to another. And there they wrote it in the new chronicle. So we have a lot of information which we have in different places but which actually have only one source and this is a big big problem we know this we are aware of this since since 150 years i would say and so we built tradition groups you can see here all these circles have these monasteries which go back to the same roots to the same chronicles in general so in inside of these circles you can expect the same um, events in the chronicles and outside we mostly don't have them or if we have them then it's good because then it's more reliable so what is actually documented in the sources it's not if a uh, rain happens today that the uh, monk will go uh, in his room and write down it rained today no it is only if the rain was really really exceptional like the events we saw in, in the Rhineland in, in uh, this month, this would be mentioned in a chronicle, everything else in this year, not maybe uh, the epidemics, if they would have realized it. So we have only the most extreme warm and extreme cold, the most, um, um, uh, yeah, the most extreme events mentioned in the sources. We always have to have this in mind in this early and high Middle Age sources. This is a big table, looks big, but it's actually not so uh, heavy. I will show you very quickly. This is the 20th century. We have satellites around the, cost, uh, around the Earth. 
And so we can direct uh, measure our climate. If you go back 200 years, we have instrumental measurements. It's possible to use a thermometer to get the temperature. So we have defined units. In the 16th century, we already have some thermometers, but we don't have defined units yet. So they are only descriptions. And if you go back and back in time, you can see here in the 6th century, this is the early Middle Age period, we have not so many descriptions of individual uh, events, only uh, events which were extreme in, let's say, 10 years or something like this. And if you go still further back in Europe, it's always in Europe, and we have uh, ancient writing culture and ancient orant culture, and like the Sinflut, the Atlantis saga, stuff like this, these are myths, these are songs, so they were later written down and they show only events which appear in 300 to 1000 years. This leads us to the uh, astronomical um, events, because these are the signs in the heaven which were interpreted from the people if, uh, in the time. So we have here the sun in the middle. Sorry, it's still German. I just realized I thought it's English. Uh, so we have the sun in the middle. We have the earth. We have the moon. We have shade of the moon. We have transits of the inner planets like Mercury and Venus. We can see this in uh, on the planet Earth, which in Europe uh, nobody observed. But I know in China there were some people already looking at transits of these inner planets. We have the meteor streams, we have the comets, which were regularly visible like Comet Halley, and we have supernova, um, new stars, guest stars, which uh, made their way in the historical source. So this leads me to uh, uh, the observation space, because uh, before my work, every, every event was described in the same geographical space like the other events. But it's very, very different. Like you have a tornado. This is uh, uh, only, you can experience this in a, only a very, very small area, only in a valley or something like this. And you have other things like uh, a supernova. You can see this from the whole planet. So you can see here with this uh, uh, radius, um, there are events which you can realize only within 50 kilometers and not more. And you have events which you can realize even 5,000 kilometers and more. And this is very, very difficult. And you always have to have this in mind. You see here the solar eclipse is on a, a, a very small scale, only with 50 to 250 kilometers. This is because the shade of the sun is very limited. The trace is very long. We will see it goes around half of the Earth, but the trace is only like 20 or, or 30 kilometers where you can really see it. So the solar eclipses are actually uh, small, but the lunar eclipses and the comets and stuff like this are uh, documented worldwide. We have to have a quick look to a special case. These are the locusts. Locusts are very common on the planet Earth. We have uh, we had a last year locust uh, plague in Africa. We have often uh, uh, events that locusts from Africa um, jump over the Atlantic to Brazil and then um, live there on, go there on. And even in medieval Europe, we had a lot of locusts in the early and high. Middle Ages. This is because we drained our rivers in the late Middle Ages, and in this early time, all the rivers are still wide. So the uh, possibilities for the locusts were much better than today. You can see here there is a very, very big plague of uh, locusts in the year 873. This was the biggest in my 600 years, and we have a lot of sources, more than 30 sources, which mention this locust in this year, in this special year. And usually we would expect an entrance like this. It's in the analysis from the city of Xanten. The old plague of the Egyptians arose because already in the Old Testament, we have 
the low cost mentioned. And this is direct the connection which this writer made to this event. So this is the usual expected entrance. But we also have entrances like this, Analis Fuldensis, it's actually written in Mainz, it's a little bit complicated, is one of this tradition group, Mainz Fulda. We have here the entrance, a plague of a completely new kind appeared. So this is surprising because this writer, he is a monk, he knows the Old Testament very well. So why didn't he mention that in the Old Testament, the locusts are already um, mentioned? So if you see here more, then he describes it more like a natural biologist. So the uh, they length, the sickness, uh, 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 how many teeth they have, uh, they are rock hard and stuff like this. So it's really like a biologist. Uh, and to me, for more than six years, this, uh, uh, this writer was the most reliable source for the early Middle Ages. But after six years, I realized the following um, pattern in his work. First, we have a quick look on the trace of this locust. You can see here, they started at the Black Sea. Then there were three different directions. They took the way south of the Alps to Spain. We have uh, uh, sources in Spain. They took the way here uh, to Southern Italy and they took the way north of the Alps and the Rhine. You can see here, there are also daily dates in the sources, in this early sources, you can, we can really follow by date uh, on this uh, locust. Uh, past year, they, they went over the channel, they went over to Ireland, we still have some descriptions from there. So we have a lot of contemporary um, uh, testimonies of this locusts. And because we have a lot of this, our writer from the Annales Fodensis, he thought, okay, the locusts are also mentioned in the revelation of John, the Apocalypse, it's trumpet number five, where the locusts come to torture the people for five months. And now he is comparing this. In this year, he has trumpet number five. So he is looking in the Bible, in the Apocalypse, with what is in trumpet number six. So a third of mankind is killed. Now he makes his next entrance in the next year, a third of the people in Germany and uh, French died of hunger and plague. But if so, why is he the onlyest in Europe who mentions this? We have here more than 30 um, different sources which mention the locus, but we have only him who mentions that the third of the people died. So this is an invention by, uh, an invention by him. Now we look at the seventh trumpet and we will find it in his work. And if we go further with the trumpets before, then we will find uh, the same uh, uh, events in his work, not at given dates, but he tries to figure it, uh, in his lifetime to see, okay, which one could be trumpet number two, and then he will find it, he will find an event who is uh, 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 comparable to this. So oh, this is a real problem because now at the end of my work, actually I have to start with all the 120 chronicles I had under view and have to look, do they have a pattern like this? And I found this pattern only after six years. So it's really, it's hard. So now my students will have this task and I will give them uh, in the next step, uh, a, a look in the other uh, sources. So you, but you see the problem with the European sources. This table is also big and heavy, but it's actually not. This is the end result of my work. So you can see here earthquakes are the most mentioned um, events in the whole time. You can see here in every century how often they appear. We have a big gap in the sixth, seventh, and eighth century. This was already known. It's just stronger now the argument. We lost a lot of chronicles in this time in Europe and we don't have so much reliable information uh, about this time in general. Um, yeah, now let's have a look to the... Um, omen to the predictions of births and deaths 
of important rulers from the 6th to the 11th century. This is only the second part out of my table. You have the table in the text which Matthias sent around on page 722. Um, these are the dates of natural events, of astronomical events. You can see here Comet Heli in this year 870, uh, 837. Um, you have also observations of this comet in uh, Chinese sources, even in uh, Korea and Japanese and everywhere in, in uh, Asia. And in Europe, a uh, writer tries to explain to the ruler that he will die, but he didn't die. He died three years later. And now the same writer has a problem to explain this, why <laughs> the ruler didn't die in the year when the comet appeared. And so he explained it then three years later with a solar eclipse. Because he now, the, uh, the ruler failed to die three years ago, he used the solar eclipse, but other writers of his time didn't know that he failed <laughs> three years ago. So they combine the death of Louis the Pious to this comet in the same year. So they are uh, always the question, how close are you to the ruler? Another example, uh, here in 1066, you know, the famous Battle of Hastings uh, uh, was there. So the comet here in this year, uh, who appeared in this year, um, is used for in England for the Battle of Hastings as a, as a prediction in Europe for the death of Godfrey III and in Byzantine, in Constantinople, for the death of Emperor Constantinus Dukas. So the same astronomical event is used uh, to predict very, very different um, things. And I think this is the point where we can go with our comparison with China in, because we will find more like this. But I think it would be very interesting to have in the end a map of like Europe, Asia and China um, and with all the different predictions which, which uh, 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 were taken for this like for this event with the comets here. You can see here, this is not only predictions for the deaths of people, even the comet here in 905 is the prediction of the birth of an emperor. And you also can see not always the appearance of the com comet and the event is in the same year. Here is the difference four years. <laughs> and sometimes the prediction is after the um, death of, uh, uh, like here, uh, the death of Siegerich is in 994 and the comet appears a, a year later. But in the Chronicle, you can see it, he just put it in to, to fit it, to, to make it fit to his intention. So now we come just short to the solar eclipses. We have a lot of different types of solar, uh, solar eclipses. We have the sun, we have the moon between sun and earth. The moon has a shade and this shade we can observe. This is the main principle, but the distance between the moon and the earth is changing. So sometimes the moon is more far away and then the shade is not directly going to the uh, surface of the earth. So the shade is different. This is an annular eclipse. You can see it here. This is an annular eclipse. This is a total uh, eclipse. Uh, see, best seen here in 1999 was a very total eclipse, one of the best pictures with uh, this corona of the sun visible. This is really dark to the people and it happens only once in 300 years per uh, yeah, city or per place. This is because um, our moon uh, has a, 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 an angel to the earth. The, the, uh, uh, he's not uh, on, the, on the same trace on the same laps. Uh, and this is the so-called Tsaros cycle is already um, yeah, described by Aristoteles in the uh, ancient history. So uh, uh, they realized that uh, this cycle has a length of 18 years. So always after 18 years, the same cycle appears. But there are 43 different such cycles. And you can see here one cycle. It starts here in the year 1000 at the North Pole. And then in uh, uh, all these years, uh, uh, the shade will come on this trace. 
and it finishes after uh, 1,300 years at the South Pole. And we have 43 uh, systems cycles like this. This is why we have so many eclipses on the Earth. Um, here you can see one eclipse uh, over Europe. You have here this um, animation which shows you uh, there's a different, it's almost the same trace, but it's a different of uh, uh, 750 years between these two. Um, you can see it's uh, over Cologne, it's uh, over Italy, it's here almost over Jerusalem, and then it disappears and it's the same here. So this is a total eclipse visible in Europe. But there, what? there are other total eclipses like this one in China. You see here, it starts in Eastern Africa. It goes here over India, and then it ends in China next to Beijing. And in Europe, nobody would realize anything because this green, green line is the last percent of the semi-shade. So nobody will see anything of this. But this is my point. We have some really few, few uh, uh, solar eclipses which uh, uh, are visible in Europe, like here in Italy, in Constantinople, and then uh, in China. This is the year 306, and I come now to my best example. In this case, it's 1415. You can see here from Spain through, uh, through Germany, Poland, and then in China, almost hitting uh, Beijing in this year. So we have the same event uh, at the same time uh, on the planet. We have, I found some uh, um, sources in Europe. We have descriptions in the monastery of Alteich near Alteich in Bavaria, a dark eclipse of the sun occurred. And he also gives the length. So it's six minutes. He can pray to misery me in this time. Um, a, a very common um, prayer in the Catholic Church. In Prague, the same event is mentioned, the whole sun um, eclipsed. In Wroclaw, you can see it's in Poland. So in Wroclaw, it's, uh, it's totally perfect. An eclipse of the sun uh, happened and there was terror and alarm among many people. Nobody expected this. And we have also, but I didn't have the time to look for this in the same year, the famous battle of Agincourt. And uh, I will now have a look in the French sources if there are uh, some people who try to connect this um, solar eclipse with the um, horrible um, result of the French in this battle. It's the same, uh, uh, it's the same solar eclipse, but a different a view, you can see here the half shade, and this is the trace of the full total eclipse. And um, it's more interesting because it's the second day of the famous process against Jan Hus. And uh, the sun was entirely eclipsed so that the mass, the holy mass, could not be celebrated without lightning. This was a sign that Christ, the son of justice, had darkened the hearts of many prelates who were eager to put Master Jan Hus to death on the decision of this council. So the source provides already parallels to the, to the crucifixion of Christ and um, this total eclipse, God himself tries to delay the council to uh, condemn Jan Hus to die. So this is one uh, uh, source, I think we can find a lot more. And now it would be interesting to see what happened in China with the same um, account. We cannot say this today because it's a longer search, but uh, it's, it's a good starting point, I would say. This are in the, is in the moment my list of, I think, 15 events from the 10th to the 16th century. Uh, these are all to uh, 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 mostly total eclipses. Um, which were visible in Europe and China. So uh, we can, we will work on this. The first number is the number of the NASA. The NASA numbered all the eclipses from 3000 before Christ until yeah, today. So every eclipse has its own number. And you can see there are sometimes a lot of numbers in between. So now we come to the dragons as last point. Um, 
In Italy, we have this entrance, among other miraculous signs, a fiery stone like a lump. It's actually a meteor uh, or uh, of glowing iron came through the air from west and appears like a walking serpent. And the next author in Würzburg, in the, for the Würzburg Annals, he made it a dragon, a dragon. He didn't write like a walking serpent, he had a draco. Uh, visus est, so a dragon was visible. He doesn't understand the uh, sentence before, so he invents a dragon. I have 60 more examples like this, but let's stay with this one, because now it's interesting what this comparison between European sources and sources from other regions can bring, um, because I found this um, description from Tunisia in the same year. Um, it's in uh, Kairouan, and the meteor there um, was used. There was a, even a meteor fell in this year, and the meteor was used in the mosque, and it was for a long time the third holiest place of Islam, not before Jerusalem. Uh, later, Jerusalem became the third uh, most important place, and uh, it, wa uh, it was uh, equivalent to the Hajj to Mecca, and Medina. And now we have the same year, we have the same meteor, and now we can assume that this is actually the same astronomical event. The meteor broke apart in two parts, and then one part was going down in Italy, and the second part in Tunisia. So it brings a lot of, uh, 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 yeah, uh, to look in uh, different areas. So in the, this is the end, my last uh, slide. We uh, have these nature events, Solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, the comets we con can compare uh, with the transits, uh, transits. We don't have so many in Europe, but we have the gas stars, the supernovae, and we also have the dragons, not like in China and the famines. But uh, I would finish with this and would give to Shaya and would like to hear more about the dragons. <laughs>